glad you all could make it. Um, so today we are joined by Chloe Daxworth, um, and they are the co-founder and CEO of Valence Vibrations. Um, it's an AI startup delivering emotional classifications in real-time conversation to improve communication and promote empathy across demographics, including neurotypes. Chloe is personally motivated by democratizing democratizing, sorry, access to wellness in every facade of what it means to be well. Okay, I'm okay. In the wake of the pandemic, she co-founded Hope Hearted, a Bay Area-based nonprofit that has provided PE, PPE to thousands of unhoused people. Chloe also served as the student program manager of BrainMind, an ecosystem dedicated to closing the valley of death in neurotech investing. So welcome everybody to today's event and Chloe, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I think I'm unmuted now. I'm not sure if there's a way for us to just admit everyone from the meeting room, but I'm seeing a lot of people pop in just as a heads up. Um, thank you so much for enabling me to be here. I was really excited to chat with a bunch of fellow neuro entrepreneurs and neuroscience students. Um, would love to keep this like very conversational so I can make sure I'm like covering the topics that are most interesting to all of you. So to start out, could we get sort of a poll of the room of like where you're at in your educational journey? So for people that are a high school student, could you raise your Zoom hand? Okay, seeing a few. Do we go younger than high school in SN Chimayi or no? High school start? No. Usually not. Okay, all right. What about college students? Cool. And then anyone post grad? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, and then last question, I don't know how we're gonna do this poll, but we'd love to know just sort of like where you are in the world uh, located. So maybe put that in the chat. I'm just curious. I think I've definitely noticed from speaking to folks at SN that it's been really cool to see like the global movement that you've created. I'm very familiar with like the neurotech scene in the US, but it's really cool to see people from all over the world interested in studying neuroscience and innovation in it. Okay, cool. So I'm seeing way more people from outside the US than inside the US. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for giving me um, sort of a frame of reference of who I'm speaking to. Um, as I was introduced, I am the co-founder and CEO of Valence Vibrations, which is a neurotech emotion AI startup. We are essentially trying to improve emotional communication across people to improve digital accessibility. We also have customer intelligence applications helping sales and customer support staff and researchers better interpret how customers and research subjects are feeling. So today I wanna to give you an overview of sort of my entrepreneurship journey and successes and failures along the way. I also want to keep it very conversational, as I said, um, so feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point, and then I'm going to leave a lot of question time at the end as well, so we can go back and forth with Q&A, as I find that oftentimes in sessions like that, that's been the most helpful for me as I was going along my journey. So. We'll start out from the beginning. Um, I studied computational neuroscience at USC. I was really excited about neurotech. I started pre-med as probably a lot of you did as well as I, I find it's pretty common in neuroscience. I think the challenge starting pre-med is that we are really excited in high school about science. We want to help people. Being a doctor seems like the next step to do so. We don't have a lot of perspective oftentimes on what neurotech looks like in the industry or even in academia. So it's really cool to see a lot of high school students here today that got an earlier start than I did. Um, I think one of my first moments of being really interested in neuroscience that catalyzed uh, my future roles was going to a Stanford internship while I was in high school and meeting Dr. David Eagleman. 
Not sure if any of you know him. He's the CEO of Neosensory. Neosensory creates the haptics wristbands, helping deaf and hard of hearing people. Okay, a few people have uh, met him. Um, he, he essentially creates haptics technology to help deaf and hard of hearing people better interpret sounds as vibrations, as well as people with tinnitus. So lots of cool work coming out of Neosensory. Uh, in high school, I got to try on a very early version of the neosensory bugs, um, so their haptic wristband. At that point, they were mainly focused on the vest and sort of prototyping the early bugs, but I was really excited about this idea of sensory substitution and um, addition and being able to create new sensory experiences for disabled people and substitute existing senses in new modalities. So when I got to college studying computational neuroscience, I was the COVID generation. So I was only really a freshman in college on campus in person for like six months. And I'm sure a lot of you had your educational journeys like stopped or in some way halted by the pandemic. For me, it was difficult to leave school, but it also opened up a ton of opportunities for me that really catalyzed my ability to start my own company. So coming into freshman year, met my co-founder in the dorm at USC, decided to go and work for Brain Minds um, once COVID sort of shut down school and I had some extra time on my hands. And through Brain Mind and really their excellent ecosystem of neuro entrepreneurs, academics, technologists, investors, policymakers, um, neuroethicists, philosophers, um, and all sorts of people in between and the many tangentially related fields to neuroscience that exist. I was able to form a perspective on how neuroscience as a field was changing and what that looked like outside of the very strict confines of academia, like how we can actually bridge neurotechnology bench to bedside. And so I reconnected with David Eagleman and entered a hackathon challenge while I was uh, working for Brain Minds. And Neosensory was having this hackathon to create new sensory substitution tech using their Neosensory bugs. And so that was really our initial start as a company. We came up with this idea, myself and my co-founder from USC, of how can we create real-time emotional signals that are communicated across people to help people better read the room. Our initial focus was neurodiversity. We as a team had personal connections to neurodiversity and really wanted to help autistic, ADHD, and other people that significantly struggle with emotional perception to improve emotional perception cues. So that was the early idea um, to backtrack a little bit during the same time, I was working on a nonprofit, uh, Hope Hearted, which is what Cora was describing. The nonprofit was helping and is still helping unhoused people all across California gain access to COVID PPE and sanitary supplies. I'm still on the board of that nonprofit, but that was sort of my first like venture into entrepreneurship. So coming out of this hackathon, I was like, I already made a nonprofit. I really want to see this technology come to life in a real way for people that can use it and um, so we did, my co-founder and myself initially started with this very consumer-facing application for wearables. Coming out of that hackathon, we did a couple of accelerators at our school, which I think had mixed results. Some of them were more helpful than others. Um, met a ton of mentors along the way though, which I think was the most powerful part. And we're able to build out our product and ultimately commercialize it. We raised money along the way, which I can talk about if anyone's curious about the venture capital process and journey. There's, I mean, you can do many, many sessions on that individually, but and sort of our general story, we started with this Apple Watch application initially is what we launched last December. And now we're working on enterprise solutions. So essentially using emotion AI to improve digital connection on platforms like Zoom, as well as in other virtual interviewing platforms, uh, customer research, qualitative research applications, as well as sales customer support. Um, digital accessibility for diverse teams, so helping map emotions across people that might be across the world with many different accents, neurotypes, genders, etc. And that, that all affects the way that we perceive emotions. 
to give you some context on the science behind our technology and like really how this all applies to neurodiversity and our initial focus. Essentially, emotions are highly context and demographic specific. And so it was long thought erroneously that autistic people and other neurodivergent neurotypes had a particular deficit in emotional perception of all people, and that deficit needed to be corrected with intensive therapy. To date, in the United States and in many other countries across the world, some of the only insurance-covered therapies are focused on trying to essentially get autistic people to behave and communicate less autistic or more neurotypical. And these therapies are having very bad outcomes in the way that people are able to live their life, communicate with others. They're not pro-diversity, they are um, pro-conformity. And so we really wanted to create a tool that can bridge emotional perception across people while not putting the onus of correcting communication on any one demographic, because the reality is that communication in order to occur needs to be mutually intelligible. And so the burden of accommodating a normative communication standard right now is falling on the underrepresented person in the conversation, and that shouldn't be the case. And that's not just neurodiversity, it's also racial diversity, gender diversity, age diversity, etc. When you are seen as other in a given communication environment, you have the highest burden to try to accommodate the people around you, and you're the most likely to be misunderstood in that conversation. And that leads to real life bad outcomes like discrimination in employment opportunities or just increased senses of loneliness and despair um, from people that feel really isolated from their social environments. So that's really what's at stake in the technology that we're building. We want to help people connect across all these barriers with truly shared understanding across people. And I think that that's what's motivated us through this very difficult journey of starting a startup while in college, while having to juggle a ton of other responsibilities, also in the context of a global pandemic that was very emotionally and physically draining for a lot of us in, in ways that we're still really uncovering. Um, so that's really my sort of high level story. I would love to open up the floor to some questions before I go into depth on any one thing so I can better understand what might be most relevant to you all. Everyone, please feel free to unmute, raise your hand, or you can drop any thoughts or questions in the chat as well. All right, do you want to go first? Is it Elif? Correct me if I pronounced that wrong. Okay, thank you. Uh, so how did you get a chance to work at Stanford with Mr. Eagleman? Um, so I was doing a like summer program. I wasn't working directly with him. He was a guest speaker at the summer program. And I essentially applied. I'm not sure if Stanford still has it. It's um, called CNIX, uh, Cognitive Neuroscience Immersion Experience. I did that like probably I'm dating myself. It's maybe been like six or seven years since I did that. But that was um, how, initially how I met him. He was the keynote speaker. Oh, apparently it is happening this week. So um, perhaps for people that are more local, you could um, apply for that next year. I know that we had some international students in our program, but it's a little bit difficult. So um, yeah, definitely recommend taking advantage of the opportunities that are in your area. I know that it was difficult for me when I was in high school because it felt like there weren't a lot of like research programs that were very accessible for high schoolers. And that was difficult to sort of manage because it seemed like some students were like getting in working in a Stanford lab for many years in high school and using that for college admissions and that was like frustrating to me because I didn't have any connections like that. I would uh, recommend just like sending a, a blast to a bunch of professors even when you're in high school if you want to do lab research because a lot of them will still take high school students so don't be afraid to like take initiative. Um, the worst that they can do is like say no or not respond. And some of the best opportunities that I've had in my life have come from me sending cold emails and just asking for them. 
So don't be afraid to do so. Um, okay. noticing, Thank oh, you. Um, I have one question too. Um, so I'm running a neurotech startup right now. So we we have just started and it's about the you know, like paralyzed people to move on their chairs just by thinking with EEG. Uh, so I want to um, be, like grow my startup like more, but um, like what you can advise to me. Sure. Um, could you give me some more context on like sort of where you're at in your educational journey um, and like what the unique value proposition of your startup is? Because I know of a number of like EEG VCI companies so just want to better understand like your unique niche. Okay, so um, we have just started to project and I am a rising junior right now in high school. So okay. um, we have just started, but uh, like when paralyzed people are uh, on their electrical chairs, EEG sends signals to Raspberry Pi 4 and then uh, helps like people to uh, do like basic commands like go, go right, go left. Um, so I actually want to join a competition uh, with that project, maybe not like release it in market, but just um, join a competition so um i want to pursue my career in the field of neurotechnology but um you know i i don't know how to start uh because like in my country neurotechnology is not a well-developed field it's it's mostly in us so it's a little bit hard to find opportunities for high school students especially when you're an international student because i can't come to usa um yeah. like virtual internships so um how uh which advice can you give us uh if we can't do an internship we are can't sure. yeah like not able lots to of do people it. can't do internships sorry to cut you off um lots of people can't do internships during high school so i didn't want to like i want to preface this by saying like totally um I think the norm is to not do neurotech internships in high school. You're already like way ahead of the game in trying to create VCIs in high school. So props to you. I was definitely not doing that when I was in high school, um, but would have loved to have been doing that. I'm not sure if you're tapped into Neurotech X. Um, there's a number of like student competitions. They have clubs and then they also run hackathons. Um, perhaps participating in a virtual hackathon would be a good first step. I'm not super familiar. I think you said you were from Turkey. I'm not super familiar about like the landscape in Turkey or what companies in Turkey might be running hackathons, but I do know Neurotech X does have some virtual hackathons that you can participate in. Also just like doing a search for like student hackathons that take place internationally across the world. There's, I think a couple dozen of them that um, are going on during the summer. So perhaps not even just participating in a um, like neurotech specific hackathon, but trying to find a more general international high school student or college student hackathon even might be the, the best uh, first place for you to go. Sorry, I can't be super helpful there. I don't just have a lot of context. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, awesome. So I'm seeing a ton of messages in the chat from people that are sending me private messages, could you just send it into the public channel so everyone can see it and we can go in order? Just wanna make sure I'm being fair. Um, so going in order from what I see, Khalid asked who's eligible to apply for the Neosensory I applied to. Um, I'm not sure if they're still running Neosensory Innovation Challenges, but anyone can apply. You just need to be able to have a Neosensory Buzz to develop on. There are certain countries that they can't ship buzzes to. so. That might be a barrier. I don't know the specific countries anymore. I know that our hackathon is pretty international. So there are uh, like different teams entering from all across the world. So you'd have to check out the Neosensory website. I will put it in the chat for you. Um, but yeah, happy to answer like more specific questions. I'll give you my email in a second too, if you wanna ask any questions like more specific to your unique situation on applying to hackathons or anything like that. Um, next question, how did you respond to discrimination or hate if you faced any? So starting a company is very difficult. Um, being a female young student founder, I'm not a student anymore since graduated college last year, but I was a student when I started the company. It was difficult. There's a lot of perceptions 
um, and like gaps in VC funding for women, female or all female teams only received 2% of all VC funding in the United States. Uh, it was a little bit less last year, actually. So raising is difficult. There's a lot of discrimination due to what's called pattern matching, which means that VCs are looking for particular archetypes of people that they've seen be successful before. And what that means in the US is they're looking for primarily white male founder archetypes that they've seen in the past be successful. And if you don't match that, if they can't see Elon Musk in you or Melanie Perkins from Canva or whoever it may be, it's more difficult to get funding. And so I think a lot of it has just been trying to prove our place in the space with our technology and with our traction so that people can't dismiss what we're doing. I would say also just like practically, it was difficult to start the company as a student. Investors wanted me to be full-time and drop out. I made the choice to graduate in two and a half years and like just go forward from there. Um, because I, I didn't want to not get my degree, but I wanted to work full time on the startup ASAP and COVID really afforded me the luxury of being able to watch recorded lectures and take online tests while still running my company full time during the day. And that's really how I had to handle it as a student. It's definitely worse for other more underrepresented people. I mean, women are underrepresented, but women of color, people of color, um, other other underrepresented groups within the founder community have a lot more difficult raising. The challenge in our market today is that because we're in a down market where it's harder to raise money in general, the emerging fund managers who typically run more diversity focused funds have less money to deploy because they're raising their own capital. And so it sort of trickles down the system where if underrepresented venture capitalists are more likely to invest in underrepresented founders, but they have less money than underrepresented founders get less money and it trickles down that way. I don't say that to um, discourage anyone here from starting a company. The reality is regardless of who you are, what background you have, starting a company is very difficult and you are going to face opposition and people doubting you every step of the way. It doesn't stop even when you have a company that's worth tens of millions of dollars. There's still a lot of people that don't believe in you, maybe don't want you to succeed, don't think that you can succeed. You're going to get a lot of bad advice. You're going to get a lot of um, people trying to discourage you from keeping on going, regardless of where your company is at. It's just sort of the reality of being a founder. There's so many ups and downs. And I think the best advice I can give for that is taking everyone's advice with low ego, being able to absorb as much advice as you can, while still having the discernment to know what applies to you and what doesn't apply to you. Because at the end of the day, you are the person that understands the company that you're starting better than anyone else. If you don't understand your company and your problem solution set better than anyone else, then you shouldn't be starting that company because you need to have founder market fit in order to be successful. Like you need to be the exact right person to make this company successful due to some unique edge. Maybe it's a personal experience that you have and the technical background to do it. Maybe it's a unique market insight that you're thinking about in a way that incumbent companies aren't thinking about. Whatever it is, like you have some unique aspect of what you're building, your team, your background, your conviction in the company that isn't universal. And most people would consider a contrarian viewpoint. And because of that, you're able to be successful. If what you were doing was obvious to everyone, then it would already exist. That's sort of my best advice there. So yes, there is discrimination. It's a tough space. I'm not gonna like lie or make any illusions there. It's, it's very difficult to be a founder. It has some of the worst gender and racial gaps in funding of any industry. Um, but that's just what makes it so much more rewarding when you do succeed. That's sort of my, my best advice there. Um, going on to the next question, what was your Apple Watch app your team created like? Um, so I think what you're asking is who created the Apple Watch application? And like, what was that team? We only have three people working full time on the Apple Watch. 
Um, and then we had a contract development team of iOS developers. So with myself, my co-founder, one ML engineer that we hired last year, and then an Apple Watch development team. Next question. How did you get to the idea of building a motion AI technology? What was the process like until you are sure that this tool is the solution? Please also share, did you work on your own or did you have teammates and how did you form the team? So as I mentioned, to answer that part first, did have a team, um, hired contractors that I found through my network, put out job ads for an ML engineer and found an excellent person for the job and then met my co-founder at school. So forming the team, is a very important and necessary step and making sure that you're working with the right people that complement your strengths and weaknesses so that you can actually execute in a timely manner is super important. And I am glad that I was able to do that. I wish that we would have had the funding to hire more people and, and go a little bit quicker there, but in a lot of ways, keeping it small and scrappy really helped us like hone in on what was important about the technology and what would have been like over-engineering before launching. The idea of building a motion AI really came to me because I saw this like very big gap in communication, specifically initially for neurodiversity, but later on just in communication in general. It seemed like so many people were being misunderstood. And this misperception was due to what's called double empathy theory. So the um, idea that communicating with someone inside your in-group you have a highest likelihood of having high emotional perception ability. But when you're communicating with someone outside your in-group, your ability to perceive their emotions is significantly decreased. In-group meaning demographics, so gender, race, age, neurotype, accent, et cetera. That was really what drove the passion for me. As I mentioned, our team has personal connections to this challenge. And so we were really passionate about this unique like, problem solution set. The process was really iterative. So started in this hackathon with like a really scrappy, not very good version. Um, and then iterated over the course of two years before launching because we really wanted to make sure that we we're developing novel IP, getting the models right, having high accuracy, having a robust audio processing pipeline so that everything can work the way that we wanted it to. Um, and we were very intentional about creating data sets through data studies that were crowdsourced with very diverse people represented so that it could truly represent the vocal diversity of our market. Initially, we're only supporting North American English in the United States and Canada. So unfortunately, the international folks here that are not from the US and Canada won't be able to download the app today and use it, but we are expanding our languages as we speak and should be releasing new languages very soon. Um, yeah, I think that answers most of your question. I'm seeing a lot of other ones come in the chat. Let's see. Do I want to recommend any programs that are related to research and virtual opportunities that are open to international college students? All of them are paid and can't find anything. Um, I am not sure actually. So I don't have a great perspective on virtual opportunities for international college students. Would definitely recommend contacting Neurotech X. They have a great international neuroscience group um, from high school, college, post-grad, beyond. And I think that a lot of their programming is virtual. I don't know exactly what they're putting on right now because it's been a minute since I've spoken with their team, but I have gotten really great feedback from them. I know Open DCI also has great international programming as well as Neurodata Without Borders. And I'm in the Slack groups for all of them. Let me actually just take that in the chat. So Neurotech X, Open. I am zero data without borders. Yes, sorry I can't be like too helpful on the opportunities for international students lens. I just don't have a like, great perspective on that since that wasn't my experience. So I can only sort of recommend the, the groups that other international students that I'm friends with have had success from. Just looking through the rest of the chat. Can you share all the resources and opportunities from the speakers in one document? Okay, I think Shumayi can handle that. 
Um, some, of, as some of you may know, we have a list of neuro-related opportunities that will be released later this academic year. Wonderful. So it sounds like Simply Neuroscience will have some more resources available for you soon. Um, do you know any startup or venture competitions which can offer us funding for the project or any program which can train our idea from scratch to prototype stage? Yes, there are not a ton of accelerator and startup competitions that will give you a small amount of funding. Um, there are, I can probably share some links actually. Why don't I do that and I'll share the links with simply neuroscience to add it to your list. I mean, I can think of probably at least 50 off the top of my head from um, things that friends have entered. A lot of them are international, though not all of them are. And the reason why venture competitions can't always support entrepreneurs in other countries is because there's legal compliance associated with investing in a company. And so they typically want you to have a US-based entity to invest in, but it depends on the venture firm and if they have an international reach or not. 500 startups, um, has a great sort of international focus, but that's for companies that are later stage than I think the students here would be focusing on. It wouldn't be like scratch to prototype, it would be like revenue generating beyond. Um, but yeah, happy to share some resources there with Simply Neuroscience to add to their lists. Can you elaborate on what hackathons are and how they are beneficial to aspiring neurotech enthusiasts? And how can you expand your skill set? beyond traditional neuroscience undergraduate curriculum and gain computational skills. Okay, so hackathons are essentially people getting together to build something in a weekend or in a very short time frame. So essentially you're hacking something together. Usually they're either very like mission driven where they have one guiding question of the hackathon and then everyone's developing scrappy technology to solve this one world problem or it's like loosely related to a topic and then you're developing things that solve for different problems within that topic there are a ton of hackathons all around the world that are going on at all times usually there's like university run ones that high school students can also enter there's a bunch of like startup run hackathons that are trying to develop their developer community, like Neosensory that was trying to develop their um, neuro hacker community of people developing haptic softwares from the wristband. And they really focus on expanding your skill set from an industry perspective rather than an academic perspective. So when you go to college and you're working with um, researchers in a lab or you're studying curriculum in a traditional classroom, you're not getting like practical hands-on experience of brain computer interfaces, for example, or other neurotechnologies. You might learn theory behind them. And there are certainly some computational neuroscience labs that are allowing undergraduates to work on BCI projects, but a huge realm of the field is just simply like not covered in academia and only exists in industry. And so being able to work on a hackathon where you can really like develop a product, not just do research that's related to a tiny aspect of that project, which is normally what's asked of undergraduate students, enables you to really upskill yourself and be able to work on the material science aspects, if that's what you're interested in, or the computational aspects, but really like take ownership over building a product rather than trying to solve a very specific research problem. Awesome, that was my question. I just have a follow-up question. Yeah. How would you recommend gaining like the educational like skill base you need in order to excel in that area beyond what's offered in academia? by yourself independently before you just jump in? Yeah, I mean, very willing to jump in. Hackathons are oftentimes built for people that like don't have the experience, but want to learn with other people that might have it. So like teaming up with someone that has skills that you lack in a hackathon is usually how it gets done. And then you can learn along the way. Um, other awesome ways that I've upskilled myself is like Coursera and similar um, online courses. So you can teach yourself to code in a couple of weeks on Coursera. You can learn Python. There's like neuro data focused Coursera courses. Um, you are interested in machine learning. Andrew Ng at Stanford has probably the best deep learning machine learning curriculum on Coursera, frankly, on the internet. He's one of the founders of Coursera, so it makes sense. But he is known as like the father of modern deep learning. And 
he has excellent courses that can teach you those skills pretty quickly. Um, I will say a lot of neuroscience right now is like focused on either hardware or software. And I mean, combining both, of course, but like if you want to work on the software side, learning machine learning is a very useful skill. If you're more focused on hardware, then it's more material science, electrical en engineering, biomedical engineering as well to understand like material compatibility and biocompatibility issues. So there's definitely like different ways you could specialize within neuroscience or even within computational neuroscience. I previously worked in an, a connectomics lab, which is essentially mapping all of the neuronal and non-neuronal connections, or neuron is the non-neuronal connections aspect, but mapping all the connections in the human brain and nervous system and being able to do so in animal models at first for ultimately humans is like the ultimate goal of those imaging studies. So that was a really interesting aspect of computational neuroscience that was completely divorced from like the realities of building a practical BCI device, even though it's certainly applicable, it's a very different like skill set in the nearer term. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. Let's see. I'm not seeing any more questions, but please like ping me if I missed one. I know someone also responded a bit earlier about um, venture and like wanting to learn more about the venture capital process. Do you have any more specific questions? Or I can talk about something else if, if someone wanted to expand on another question that I was answering. We have, it looks like 20 more minutes. I didn't ask that question, but could you expand on what the venture side of neurotech entails? Sure. Um, so like raising venture, um, do you have like a specific question on that or just sort of like what it means to even like raise money? Basically what it means, a broad overview. Okay, sure. So essentially um, venture capitalists are people that invest in startups. And there are also angel investors that are like private people that invest in startups. Venture capitalists are people that are investing out of a fund. So within a fund, there are investors that invest in the fund, and then there are investors for the funds that invest the fund's money in startups. It's probably the easiest way to explain it. Raising venture is essentially proving as a startup that you can achieve a profitable high growth outcome for them. So for some funds, they want like 10x growth where like they're going to get a 10x return on their investment. Others want much higher multiples. Some are okay with lower ones and the impact investment model. Essentially, startups need to oftentimes pitch investors to get startup funding in order to accelerate their development and then ultimately achieve profitability and independence from capital. Um, profitability is the goal, but improving revenue streams is also a, a goal. So being able to be profitable, but like by a large margin is the goal. And then revenue generating more each round. So earlier stages, not everyone needs to raise venture capital, by the way. Some people can just what's called um, bootstrap and use their own money and sort of focus on generating revenue earlier on and then use that early revenue to catalyze future growth. That typically is a slower process, but not always. If you can get some startup funding to pay for R&D, engineers, material, hard costs, et cetera, then use that to develop the technology, especially in neurotech, that's often the way that you have to go just because there's a long regulatory pathway. I won't have time in this session to go through what the FDA regulatory pathway looks like in the US, and I'm sure there's very different ones in each of your countries, but basically when you're operating in a regulated space, you need to have a very different like company life cycle than a software company like mine, where there are regulations governing like privacy laws and the way that we can store and transmit data across people. Um, and they're also like best practices in enterprise, but it's not the same as like trying to get an implant approved by the FDA. That's a very long process. It oftentimes takes a lot of capital upfront in order to do so before you will ever achieve any profitability. 
The reason being that you're not able to sell your product if you are regulated. Uh, FDA regulated product until you've been approved and so you're not able to generate revenue early on by just releasing a prototype or an MVP of the product like you are on a software company and so essentially you pitch venture capitalists in stages so you'll have different rounds and you'll raise certain amounts of money per round in order to hit your next 12 to 18 months of milestones to raise the next round not everyone keeps raising rounds. Sometimes you raise a few, then maybe reach a certain level where you're self-sustaining and don't need to keep raising money in order to grow the business. But oftentimes, like the largest companies, you know, to raise many rounds before achieving the size that they have. So that's sort of a general overview of what venture capital looks like. Happy to answer like a, a more specific question. I won't have enough time in this conversation to go through like all the ins and outs of what it means to raise. But if there's a specific question, happy to answer it there. Okay, there's two more questions. If I have an idea, but I'm not sure if it's sustainable or not turned into a business, it requires a lot of funding to implement the idea into reality. Where can we find the people and get the funding as international college students? So it, in general, it's very difficult to get funding before you've actually proved if your company can be a company. So you need to have a prototype and some level of validation before you can raise money. You can enter hackathons and get like early accelerator money. And I'll share a list of resources in um, the document we're talking about. But in general, you're not gonna be able to raise a substantial amount of money before you've proved that your company is sustainable and is on a path of profitability. In earlier rounds, it's called product market fit. So proving that your product is solving a real problem in a particular market that people are willing to pay for and that it's like a big burden for them that they don't have your product. So your product is very necessary to them. It's solving a big pain point. Before you have true product market fit, some companies will raise a couple hundred thousand US dollars up to maybe a couple of million dollars, depending on how successful in fundraising they were. But it's hard to go beyond that without ever proving if your idea is a sustainable business. I think what you might be referring to is accelerator and hackathon opportunities. You can get a couple thousand dollars from even like the small student ones when you win hackathons in order to build out early prototypes and see if it's something worth pursuing. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Can you tell us how to evaluate our startup ideas and revenue model? So and there's a lot of ways that's sort of like asking a very big question. Um, there's a lot of ways to evaluate startup ideas and revenue models. I think I'm happy to share some resources on the way that people like map out their business model. Um, what I would say, though, is that in general, doing customer interviews of people that would be affected by the problem you're trying to solve and need your solution are the best way to sort of validate early on that your startup idea is going to be a good one that is worth pursuing. Um, so talking to as many experts you can in the space, giving them an idea of what you're thinking about and getting their feedback early on is the best way to start. We started our company coming out of the hackathon doing a ton of customer discovery. So spoke to hundreds of people asking them, what they thought about the product, um, if this problem was a big one for them, how they're currently addressing it, how or why that's not working, and talking to other experts in the space, trying to understand like sort of what is standard practice right now and how can we innovate on top of that, and like really making sure that I understood the landscape before actually building. They're building like a real version of the product. We had like a really early prototype at that point. Um, getting out of the building and talking to people is the best way to try to evaluate early startup ideas. I'm happy to share um, a business model template as well. I'll make a note to do so. Any other questions? Yes, I actually had a question regarding uh, your nonprofit that you made. That you uh, founded so how did you necessarily like get it from a thought like how do you like have an idea of it and then actually get the ball rolling with it after that sure so i started a to backtrack a little bit i started a high school program 
um, before the nonprofit that sort of like expanded into the nonprofit. And the high school program was at a local hospital in San Jose, California, where I grew up. And it essentially provided care and kits to unhoused patients in the hospital and to all sorts of patients. But we had specific programs for unhoused patients to get clothes, get supplies when they leave the hospital. And coming into COVID, that program had to shut down. And so the high school volunteers that I asked to take over for me were like, we don't really know what to do now. We've been working on this for six months since he went to college. Let's do something to try to help address the same population in a different way because we're no longer able to work in the hospital due to COVID infection protocols. So that was sort of how we got our initial start. From there, one of my co-founders got a lawyer that she was family friends with to incorporate for us. And then we hit the ball rolling and recruiting a bunch of volunteers to help us, finding um, donations from the community, from our friends and family, advertising on the news. Um, we had a couple of news stories written about us, which brought some new volunteers and donations, um, asking local stores to give us free products to give to them. It was surprisingly successful. Um, you know, I mean, these are small budgets and small quantities. We were very grassroots oriented. So like we weren't getting massive donations by any means, but it was enough to support the community. And then later on recruiting high school volunteers to run chapters all across the state so that we were able to still run the nonprofit while we were in college and have it be self-sustaining while not abandoning like the communities that we built with the nonprofit during COVID. I think something that I see in the space too often, but then honestly, it really upsets me is that oftentimes privileged high school students will start nonprofits, then they'll go to college, they'll stop the nonprofit, they'll completely abandon the community of people that they were trying to help with that nonprofit, they'll use the nonprofit to get into a good college, but like they actually haven't done very much good and oftentimes they'll do more harm by withdrawing the support that they were giving to that community. And so I was very clear that I did not want to do that. I wanted to figure out how we can become self-sustaining even when I wasn't physically located in the Bay Area full time. And now we're expanded beyond the Bay Area. So that was also very relevant. And so finding high school chapters to be able to run what we were doing was essential. Yeah, thanks so much. Of course. And if there are any um, students here that are in California, we are recruiting right now for new chapter leads. So if anyone's interested in starting a chapter of Hope Party, I'm happy to connect you with the team too. I know a lot of you are international and in other places, but um, long shot if anyone's interested in starting a Hope Party chapter. All right, I'll check the chat. It looks like there aren't any new questions. Anyone else? Yeah, so to start wrapping up today's okay. event, I guess we could do maybe um, some more questions, maybe like a little rapid fire, that kind of thing, um, or whichever direction you'd like to head with, you can give some more details. So yeah, free reign. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, if anyone has like rapid fire, quick questions you want to send in the chat or just unmute yourself might be a little easier so I don't have to go back and forth. So I just had another question about your nonprofit. So um, did you use a fiscal sponsorship to like get your profit, like nonprofit rolling or did you like establish yourself by like from scratch? No, we were completely separate. Uh, we were our own nonprofit. So, I mean, we had like, some really small donations from like Target, Costco, Walmart. And, and when I say small, I mean like a $50 gift card to purchase a few things in their store. Um, and we, I mean, we have like ongoing relationships with some of them where they would do like repeat donations, but no, like we were our own standalone nonprofit. And we were lucky to have a co-founder that had a um, lawyer friend that was able to help us set it up relatively cheaply. And then have all of our donations go to people that actually need them. So 100% of the money that we have had donated to us has gone directly to helping unhoused people. It's not gone for any administrative costs. 
paying employees, anything like that. So it's fully volunteer run. And we've been really fortunate to have so much support from the community in order to do that. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. <laughs> I'm seeing a few more. So any online research or related things that we can do as an international student? Yeah, so I've had a few versions of this question now. Unfortunately, I really just don't have a good answer. I've shared a couple of resources in the chat, um, Neurotech X, Neurodata Without Borders, and OpenBCI have student competitions and other programming. I don't know of any online research that you can do as an international student, unfortunately. Um, I do know that there's difficulty in doing a lot of research online right now. Um, I mean, some computational neuroscience research can be done fully remotely, but everything else is a bit more difficult. I'm hoping Simply Neuroscience has some more resources for you to share in the resource guide that they're going to put out, but I just don't have a lot of purview since that hasn't been my experience, unfortunately. Next question was, what story made you feel like you made an impact? Um, I actually love this question. So we recently had a user from, I actually don't know which state he was from, but he was a United States um, resident and he is autistic. I think he's also ADHD and has a family um, of different neurotypes. So he was struggling with emotional perception, wanted to make sure that he was coming across in the most appropriate, respectful way, didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And recently his father actually passed away and he was using our technology during his father's funeral to help him with the very like emotional conversations that were happening during the funeral to better mediate those like very overwhelming encounters, which normally would have been really difficult for him, especially on a day like that. It's already like so naturally emotional just from like the nature of, of losing someone that you love. And so being able to help him on one of the worst days of his life and hearing that story later was really heartwarming. And that like is what inspires me to do this work every day, even though it's hard to meet a young founder. Um, and I have many more stories like that of, of what users have said they've used the product for, and it really helps me to hear those stories and know that we're making an impact. Um, Khaled said, unfortunately, we are in a different, or we're in different countries, but if there's an opportunity to have an online training in computational neuroscience, that would be a great opportunity to expand our knowledge in real field example. Yeah, so as I've mentioned, I don't have like a list of resources for international students. Unfortunately, um, I've answered that a couple of times now. Uh, I would recommend using Coursera and other online training courses. Similar to Coursera, you can do some research there on what has computational neuroscience. I think Coursera has a couple of classes on that that are free and you're able to finish them in a couple of weeks. Oftentimes they are based off of college course curriculum from leading worldwide universities. So that would be a great start, as well as tapping into the international computational neuroscience sort of community through programs like Neurotech Access. What are current trends in neuroscience in context to industry research? Um, okay. So current trends, I mean, there's a ton. BCIs are really popping off right now. Like there's a lot of exciting breakthroughs. Um, some companies getting FDA breakthrough designation, others getting approved to do human trials. What I will say is that as much as the American media wants to sort of portraying Neuralink as the only company innovating in this space and comparing all of the other neurotech companies to Neuralink, even when they're not developing like comparable technology, like, you know, not all BCIs are competing with each other. A lot of them have different uses and like very different modalities and patient populations. So the portrayal of neuroscience right now from a PR perspective is not very accurate in my opinion. Like the PR associated with having Neuralink um, and having Elon Musk associated to Neuralink's name, unfortunately, I think has clouded the community's perspective on 
so many companies being out there. Um, and this is nothing against Neuralink. It's a great team. I'm very excited about a lot of their recent progress. It's just that there's so many different types of brain computer interface that I want all of them to get the same recognition that Neuralink is getting. I will share one resource um, that I worked on at BrainMind in case you guys are interested in brain computer interfaces. This was a report that I put out a couple of years ago. Oh, it looks like I didn't copy my link correctly. This uh, report is on brain computer interfaces and sort of like all the different modalities that exist out there. I would recommend taking a look because it gives a lot of good tidbits on potential technologies that you could be working on. I'm really excited about some of the near term applications of BCIs for movement disorders, but there's a ton beyond movement disorders that are outlined in this graphic that I think might be really interesting to a lot of you. Other trends in the community right now is that there are more like wellness tech type solutions that are improving mental health through digital arenas. Insurance reimbursement has consistently been an issue for companies that have tried to do like digital health and not been able to get reimbursement significantly covered or at all, um, especially when you have to make a new CPT code in the United States, which means that you're like opening up a new category of reimbursement for insurance companies, bureaucratically and logistically, that's just a lot tougher. So companies are struggling with that. And oftentimes I think that tends to be a barrier in building best in class technology and pharmaceuticals. But I am excited about a lot of the innovation that's happening in space right now. And I think that right now is the perfect time to join neuroscience, regardless of your background. We have a lot of people coming to the neuroscience field from different fields like physics, material science, math, um, even things outside of science in philosophy, in ethics, um, literature. There's so many like spaces for different people to be involved in neuroscience even through things like journalism or from the investment standpoint, um, academia, policy, that there's a lot of room for people. And even if you don't see yourself being like a hardcore engineer that's going to be building the technology, now is the perfect time to get involved in another way. And there's a lot of room now, I think, for high school students and, and college students to have more exposure to neurotechnology at a younger age than even I did. So definitely applaud all of you for taking the time to come here today to learn more about my work and some of the other speakers from Simply Neuroscience to learn how you can fit into neurotech. And I will share my email in the chat if anyone, actually, let me just share my LinkedIn. That might be a little bit easier. Um, if anyone wants to connect and ask me more specific questions about ideas that you have or anything else, I know we are at time. So that's going to be the last thing that I do. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Chloe. I'm glad uh, this was a great speaking event. Um, I hope you all enjoyed and be sure to tune in for our next series in Neurofound. So thank you all for coming and bye-bye. Thank you.